How's it going, everybody? Mark Youngworth from We Are Change Oshkosh here. Lately, there's been a lot of talk in the alternative research community about directed energy weapons and HARP. Now, I understand that HARP is an issue that was big about seven to ten years ago and has kind of fallen off some up until recently due to the outrageous weather events that have been taking place. Since Dr. Judy Wood has been gaining ground in her research into directed energy weapon use on 9-11, and since a certain YouTube user by the name of DutchSense has been putting forth videos confirming HARP-affected weather, the researchers who have been looking into such energy weapon technology have been taking some serious hits even from people within the so-called research community. So what I'm going to do now is go over the facts and set the record straight. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what HARP is, what they think they do. And a lot of people, most people in the movement talk about it. But to me, it's almost like Bigfoot. Something people talk about, nobody can explain. But let's talk about what HARP uh, can do. As I said, it's a uh, an array, a field of antennas. And what it, what it essentially started as was 48, uh, a six in one direction, eight in another direction. And these are 72 feet tall with a cross diapole. So they're a column going up and then a cross diapole going like so. And by firing these antenna in a very specific order, you can focus the radio frequency energy, concentrate it to a relatively small area up in an area above the Earth's surface called the ionosphere. And let me explain sort of where the ionosphere is. You've, you've got to look about 30 miles above the Earth's surface for the very beginnings of the ionosphere, and then it stretches out perhaps as far as 400 uh, kilometers uh, out into space and even further in the upper reaches of the ionosphere. When you look at the ionosphere as this layer around the Earth, and then if you think of the Earth as also um, kind of a giant motor that's spinning around, and with that comes magnetic field lines. And these field lines go from the southern part of the poles all the way up, and they wrap around, they come back in at the northern polar regions. And in these polar regions, where those magnetic field lines interact with the atmosphere and oxygen and nitrogen, you get the aurora borealis, or the northern lights. Or in the southern hemisphere, you get the uh, equivalent of our northern lights. And it's where this energy is interacting with the atmosphere. Well, by using these naturally occurring field lines, you can actually manipulate energy coming off the ground, coming off of a field of antennas like what HARP um, has in Gokana, Alaska, which is just 250 miles uh, northeast of Anchorage. This facility that was built um, in, in, 19, in the early 1990s has been advanced significantly. It started with 48 antenna. Um, they now have 180 in the array, eventually 360. The idea is, again, to focus that energy. By firing this in, in a, um, a sequence, this array, you can create what's called cyclotron resonance, which would be visually seen as sort of a corkscrewing motion of the energy as it rolls up into the ionosphere, getting more and more concentrated as it goes. Um, just the opposite of the way radio frequency energy generally works when it comes off of a, of a broadcast antenna where we hear radio programs today. What happens in that case is the energy starts out concentrated, spreads out very, very rapidly in the same way that light from a flashlight spreads out uh, very rapidly. They follow the same basic principles uh, in physics. But as with light, it can be concentrated in the form of a laser where that light is concentrated and very, very powerful at far distances. The same is true by analogy with radio frequency energy and the HARP array. That's what makes it so much different than anything else on the planet. The upper limits of the array in terms of effective radiated power, which is not the input power, but it's the um, effective radiated power, how that energy actually relates uh, in the environment. In, in this case, the desired level is one billion watts of effective radiated power, a huge amount of energy. And being able to manipulate that energy in a variety of ways for weapons applications. Now, why would they locate a facility like this in Alaska? Do you remember when I was talking about those magnetic field lines surrounding the Earth? The idea was that if you could send cyclotron resonance, uh, this energy coming off of 
uh, the radio frequency array. This radio frequency energy in this form up to those magnetic lines of force, they'd corkscrew themselves around them. And instead of the energy flowing north to south, the energy would be using that as a waveguide to, f to go from north to south, the opposite direction. So in this case, what then happens is, as you energize these field lines around the planet, any object passing through them would encounter a huge amount of energy that would disrupt the avionics, the electronics that control the flight path of intercontinental ballistic missiles or anything else uh, in the region, including satellites, low orbiting satellites and the like. So the idea was to create this shield. That was number one. So the ideal situation presented itself in the early 90s, and it was location within the boundaries of the United States for a ground-based system that, if, that in effect, as we go through the day today, um, you'll see has all of the ramifications that were being sought uh, in the 80s under the old Star Wars concepts. The idea of a global missile shield or protection from adversaries uh, using low orbiting space platforms and the like. Well, let's get back to some of the other applications of HARP and some of the other things that it can do. One of the other applications that came up um, early on was the idea of what's called earth penetrating tomography. Let me make that really simple. Uh, by analogy, uh, it would be like x-raying the earth or looking into the earth several kilometers or several miles deep to look at underground structures for mineral deposits, uh, nuclear facilities, tunnels, mining facilities, all those kinds of things can be detected by earth penetrating tomography. Now, the way that this would work with HARP is really unique, and this is again going back to Dr. Eastland's patents. By sending this energy up, this focused energy up to the ionosphere, what they can do is they can pulse the energy so it acts like a punch. So it's punching the ionosphere with this force that causes the ionosphere to vibrate in resonance and harmony with this signal on the ground. So, if, for instance, in, uh, in Norway where they have one of these facilities operating, uh, they were able to play Wagner uh, in a way that got the ionosphere to literally vibrate to Wagner as an example. In the low frequency range, extremely low frequency range, the ELF range, it sends a signal back to the Earth, and ELF uh, signals are very long wavelengths. And what they do is they penetrate the Earth and sea all the way through the Earth and sea. Nothing stops uh, these ELF signals from penetrating. Unlike the shorter wavelengths, the millimeter and centimeter wavelengths of um, other communication systems, microwave systems, and so on, these don't penetrate very deep, so they can't get down to, say, submarines at depth. So the way we communicate with submarines around the planet is we use 14 to 26 mile long antennas buried under the ground that create these ELF signals. They're in Michigan and Wisconsin and some out on the Aleutian chain and other locations around the world. What HARP offered was a new technology that would literally change the ionosphere by sending that energy up and pulsing it in. The ionosphere then acts as a broadcast antenna sending back energy to the Earth. Uh, in the ELF range at fairly low energy concentrations, approximately the same as what the Earth naturally produces. These signals penetrate the Earth and their character is measured um, by instruments on the ground or low flying um, objects that can then pick up these signals and then deduce, determine exactly what those underground structures look like. In M MSNBC right after 9-11, um, November 27th, uh, 2001, uh, there was an MSNBC report where they cited HARP as a, as a useful technology to use in Afghanistan for locating all of those underground facilities and the like. And the reason that they knew it would work in those applications is going back to 1995 and the congressional appropriations under the defense budget in that year, they appropriated $11 million to HARP to test just that application under the caveat that if it didn't work for earth penetrating uh, tomography or they didn't test that application, it wouldn't get any more funding. Now they tested the application and on a program um, uh, on the ionosphere on a, on a show called Horizons aired on BBC TV, a professor from the University of Maryland, Professor Papadopoulos, actually talked about the results of the earth penetrating tomography test with HARP where they were looking at underground mining facilities in the area uh, surrounding Fairbanks, Alaska, and were able to determine with 99% accuracy the location of those tunnels when comparing them to the actual maps and surveys of those underground workings. But the point of the matter is that technology is not being used for mineral exploration today. It's being used 
uh, primarily for military applications, as is the case with HARP. Over the years, HARP has created, you know, quite a lot of controversy. In fact, um, you know, when you look on, if you do a search under HARP, H-A-A-R-P, on the Internet, you'll find thousands and thousands of sources and documents and materials, some of it pretty outrageous, quite frankly, and some of it right on target. Um, like any issue, uh, HARP is no exception. It draws a, a lot of controversy, draws a, a lot of misinformation to the debate as well. You know, this video was prepared to give a summation of the technology, but I recommend highly that people take a look. Get the book from your local library, Angels Don't Play This Harp. There's over 350 sources cited uh, in that book that validate all the things that we've covered today. Take a look. When you're looking at these kinds of issues, big issues that can literally change the face of the planet, um, look deeper. Make sure that the facts are there. Make sure the information is there. I'm not saying heart doesn't exist. Obviously, it does. We've seen an array of antennas. I'm not going to say point blank that heart is disinformation or that New Madrid is disinformation, although I suspect that they might be. I'm not saying HARP does not exist. Okay? For instance, I've got a marker right here. Okay? I, I'm not going to kill somebody 100 miles away by pointing the marker at Okay? So to say I have a marker, that's true. To say I'm going to kill somebody with it, that's disinformation. Okay? So here Harry's claim is that HARP exists, but it does not do the things that they say it can do. Basically he is saying that it exists, but it cannot control the weather and it cannot affect people's emotions and thoughts, and it cannot cause such things to happen as earthquakes. Let's look into this a little bit, shall we? There's a couple of other applications of HARP that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, the first one, and these are the two most, probably the most controversial um, areas of HARP. The first one deals with the idea of manipulating weather systems. And this is a very important issue because, again, you're dealing with concepts that have been attempted over the years. In fact, these days, you've actually got the United States Congress, um, two bills pending, one in the Senate, one in the House, to create a commission uh, for review of weather modification technology because commercial interests are now advancing them along with um, other militaries from around the world. So you've got economic interest interested as much as the military in controlling weather outcomes and climate outcomes for obvious uh, advantage and reasons. If you take it a little bit further and you start to look at this whole concept of using a system on the ground to aggravate um, the ionosphere. Now what else happens when that lower atmosphere rushes in? You also change uh, pressure systems in the immediate region in terms of, of lows and highs and the way those pressure systems work and the way in which jet streams flow by altering the flow of jet streams, by altering uh, the way the atmosphere is located within an area, that's where you can get these huge, uh, huge problems. Back in the uh, 1977, the United States ratified a treaty where we agreed to not use um, environmental manipulation as a weapon of war, whether it be to create earthquakes or tidal waves or volcanic eruptions or disturb the weather. Um, all of these things were restricted under that treaty when, when they involved national boundaries or crossing national boundaries. Like most U.S. treaties, um, the exemption is for domestic use. Um, the treaties we sign with all these other countries have a clause within them that allows um, use of the technologies that might be forbidden against another country to be used within the boundaries of your own country. Uh, we continued our experimentation within the United States. The idea now that we can modify weather in, to a large degree is something that's not just unique um, uh, to the United States. The Russians, who private companies have offered, according to uh, New York Times articles, have offered that um, uh, service to other uh, governments to help with uh, weather-related um, problems and issues. The idea also, um, the last three secretaries of defense, including the present one, have all called for the abandonment of that um, environmental treaty, primarily because the technologies have advanced to the point where controlling the environment for warfare applications becomes incredibly useful, also for waging covert warfare. The idea of denying a country its rainfall for its agricultural production at the same time you have an embargo ongoing 
um, would it would it would be uh, the kind of act of war that you could uh, plausibly deny and yet have a devastating effect, even a greater effect than the traditional bombs and bullets. And this really gets into the essence of what's behind HARP and technologies like HARP. But when you get into earth penetrating tomography, the problem that Brooks Agnew has and others have voiced is the idea of the energy concentrations, because what he knew is that if you used too much energy, in his worst case scenario, you could trigger uh, ge geologic events, earthquakes, those kinds of events could be triggered uh, utilizing high energy uh, densities in the ELF range. In fact, there was a uh, DOD news brief briefing. It goes back to April 27, uh, 1997, and it was a, at the um, University of Georgia, and it was Secretary of Defense William Cohen. He was commenting on weapons of mass destruction. Remember, that's way before 9-11. And one of the weapons of mass destruction he cited were environmental weapon systems utilizing electromagnetic energy for triggering earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and climate alterations. This is um, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, making that statement uh, in a DOD news briefing in 1997. Now let's go back for a minute to the, the work of Dr. Ben Eastland. You know, when he originated this concept, it was a long time ago. You know, you're now going back to the... Uh, late 1980s and the 1980s through the early 1990s. You know, technology's advanced dramatically since then. And Dr. Eastland hasn't just been sitting around uh, either. You know, he's got other projects he's been working on that are quite interesting. And one of those recently, um, in fact, in uh, October of uh, 2005, he presented a paper at Penn State on weather modification utilizing gravitational waves. Now, what's important about this paper, extremely important about this paper, is that it talks about being able to modify weather using 1,600 times less energy than was anticipated for weather modification applications using HARP. In other words, 1,600 times less energy than was once thought to be needed. It's now understood by him as a physicist um, in a major university presentation uh, to be possible. Now, when you think about weather modification, one of the other things that happened with Dr. Eastland is he was invited um, by the European Space Agency to do a paper on weather modification utilizing the HARP systems. Uh, that was completed um, in, in 1999 and presented uh, for peer review um, at a major uh, space uh, expo in, in Europe. Coming off of that paper, uh, FEMA and NASA contracted with Dr. Eason to pre prepare a paper utilizing space-based technologies, satellite-based technologies for weather modification applications. And one of the things that he saw and that he mentions in both these papers is, for instance, being able to affect tornadoes. And the idea of tornadoes, you know, you have a warm front coming into contact with a cold front, and when they come together, you get a shearing force that causes that twisting action where you get the tornado formation. So the idea of Eastland was if you could heat the cold front sufficiently that when these two fronts connected, you didn't get that energy differential to create that tornado formation, you could essentially knock out tornadoes. The problem is, of course, if you miss and you heat the already heated area um, so that there's even a greater differential when it encounters the cold front, you have more energy available to create even a more destructive tornado. The fact of the matter is, other governments around the world have taken this very seriously, including our own, and has invested a significant amount of money to look at how to, in, in fact, uh, affect these things. Remember a few years ago, back during the Clinton administration, actually, uh, there was a tornado that whipped through Oklahoma City, and Clinton showed up, and there was a press report that talked about him saying, don't worry, eventually we're going to figure out how to knock out the energy of those tornadoes, and these won't ever, ever hurt civilized uh, uh, cities again. Well. You know, that was the same city where Ben Eastland at the University of Oklahoma did his computer modeling to figure out how to knock out the energy uh, in those tornadoes a few months before. But let's get down to the most controversial issue uh, dealing with HARP, which is the physical effects on human health. And I want to get into the ELF effects because this is extremely important. And there's another video in this series on mind control, which gets into this idea of being able to be overridden by radio frequency energy from the outside. And this is what, what we know from the research. If you go back to the mid-1980s, there was a document called Low Intensity Conflict in Modern Technology. It was produced at Maxwell Air Force Base and has a section in it on electromagnetic weapon systems where it gets into a whole discussion of what was possible. If you even go back further, you've got to go back to a book called Unless Peace Comes, published in 1969. Within that is a chapter called How to Wreck Your Environment. 
And the, the reason it's an important chapter, that's before Earth Day, you know, that was later in the 70s, so you could get away with a chapter like that. But nonetheless, the guy that wrote it was a guy named G.F. Gordon MacDonald, and he was a full professor at UCLA and a science advisor to President Johnson when he was in the presidency. And he had written back then that if we could ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere in just the right way, we could return a signal to the Earth that would literally uh, manipulate the behavior of people over huge geographic areas. That was G.F. Gordon MacDonald's ideas um, going back then. But in 1969, we didn't have a way to electronically stroke uh, the ionosphere and create that kind of returning signal. Later in a book by Zbigniew Brzezinski, um, it was a book called Between Two Ages. And in this book is a reiteration of uh, J.F. Gordon's, um, or G.F. Gordon's um, ideas about, um, again, uh, being able to electronically stroke the ionosphere and return a signal to the Earth. In this particular book by Brzezinski, and Brzezinski, for those who don't remember, he later became National Security Advisor to President Carter. Um, at the time he wrote the book, he was a professor and researcher at U uh, excuse me, Columbia University. But here's this idea. Now, how do you electronically stroke the ionosphere? That's exactly what HARP does. But what kind of signal returns is what's relevant? And here's why. When you think about energy, most energy passes through us, and we have huge amounts of radio frequency energy passing through us right today. You know that that nature creates a certain amount of radio frequency energy that has always been here, but man creates 200 million times more radio frequency energy than what uh, nature creates. So that surrounds us. We're literally surrounded in that soup, and that's just radio frequency energy. When you think of that whole electromagnetic spectrum, there's a whole lot of other energy that man's created that surrounds us as well. But the human body is really unique. It's like the ultimate tuner. Uh, most energy passes through us like um, static between the stations. You know, when you're going through the radio stations and you're looking for that, that favorite uh, channel, it's when resonance occurs between the receiver and the transmitter. That thing sending the energy, the radio station, to the radio receiver, when they're in harmony, you get a nice clear signal and you get your station. The same is true by analogy within the human body. And this is what the military research has shown, is that you can affect everything down to a molecular level if you understand enough about the physics of the body and the math of radio frequency energy's relationship to it. You can manipulate radio frequency energy to affect the body. Talking a little bit more about you know, sort of what happens within the brain, how ELF signals, extremely low frequency signals, might interact. If you look at an EEG and you look at what the brain is actually doing, you look at those patterns, what we know is, is that the brain exhibits predominant brain waves during certain times and during certain activities. In your very deepest states of sleep, for instance, it's one to four hertz or pulses per second of the predominant uh, ELF frequency within the brain. In that sort of middle stage of sleep where you're actively dreaming but you're kind of consciously awake at the same time, this is the theta range, approximately four to seven hertz or pulses per second. Seven to approximately 11 or 12 hertz is the alpha range. Uh, this is where you are when you're in that zone or ideal place for learning and doing art and that kind of activity. The better ranges get into where you're actively listening and participating all the way up to agitated states. And what we know is that any external signal, whether it be flickering light or whether it be bioral beat created by sound or whether it be electromagnetic energy being pulsed through the body or radio frequency energy, all of these things at the right pulse rates can override normal brain function and change uh, the way our brain chemistry uh, then looks because it starts with the energy interactions that then create the chemical uh, reactions that then create changes uh, in our behaviors. So the idea of accidentally triggering these kinds of events or deliberately doing it, as was discussed by Zbigniew Brzezinski and McDonald, the idea that you could literally do this and affect 70 or 80 percent of the population within a large area. HARP can do this as a side effect or a deliberate effect based on the science and research done by the military in developing these technologies. It's not one of the stated goals of HARP, uh, but it is an issue that needs to be looked at and one that Russians and Europeans have begun to raise concerns about because their research also shows exactly what we're saying uh, is in fact the case. So you've got, when you look at HARP, a very versatile instrument from earth penetrating tomography and earth imaging affecting weather systems, affecting communications, over the horizon radar, global shielding, all of those applications for obvious reasons uh, people can see strategic advantage. Now, 
I don't have to tell you. You can look around at your friends on Facebook, and you can see all the postings about Harp, about New Madrid, about all this other stuff that nobody can prove. Harry claims that these are things nobody can prove. So let's take a look at a YouTube channel by a user named DutchSense. Check out his work and its ridiculous consistency. Dutch very frequently predicts many harp related weather events by looking at the radar, picking out what are called harp rings, which are radar anomalies that show up as what are essentially perfect circles, and at the center of each ring, within 24 to 48 hours following the appearance of the ring on radar, the center of the ring area will receive severe weather. Let's take a look. Hey YouTube, Dutch Sense here. It is 9.21 p.m. Central Standard Time on Saturday, May 21st, 2011. And 48 hours ago, just a little over 48 hours ago, I put out a harpering morning for Belton, Missouri, right on the Kansas border. And look at what we've got going on right now, guys. We've got a very severe cell, uh, the most severe out of all the cells that are existing right now. It's got a white center, which means heavy hail and damaging winds, and it's heading right towards Belton, Kansas. You can just take the storm track on here, and, and you can definitely see it. Um, let me see if I've got a... Uh, there we go. All right, look at the cone of projection on this. It's going right towards Belton. Here's my video from two days ago. Let me just play it for you here. City. It's a very obvious ring appearance, and it's not out of Kansas City, actually. It's out of Belton, Kansas. Belton, Kansas, okay? So those are the main towns that I can see so far. Now we can go further west. This will be the storm that's going to be affecting these towns over here. So we're looking All right, there you go, guys. So I, I named Belton based on that harp ring, and look at this storm that's coming towards it, just so you can see the comparison towards the others. Uh, the others are severe thunderstorm. We've got a tornado, possible tornado here, and uh, well, that's what we've got going on right now. So I just wanted to show you that as another harpering confirmation. Uh, you name the town right to the town. I mean, literally, this just got upgraded to a tornado just now. Possible tornado damaging winds and hail. There you go, guys. Uh, if you're from Belton, if you know anybody in the area, tell them to watch out. Hey YouTube, Dutch Sense here. It is 1 a.m. Central Standard Time on Sunday, May 22nd, 2011. And we have a harp ring outbreak that's occurring right now. Um, I'm going to start with IntelliCast and we'll go ahead and show you what's showing up on their radar and then we'll move around to a few others. Um, you can see out of basically Little Rock, Arkansas, um, there is a series of concentric rings appearing, basically covering the entire state. And I truly believe that's coming from uh, a ground-based station, and it's showing up as interference, but this is actually a sign of severe weather that's going to come to the center of this ring within 24 to 48 hours after this storm blows through. Same with uh, Louisiana here. Um, it looks like it's coming out of, let's find it, a little south of Nachidoc Nachidocus, um, west of Alexandria, basically Fort Polk. Okay, now let's go further north, and there's a giant ring return that's appearing basically um, almost right over my house, uh, the edge of it. Let's go ahead and wait for it here. There, okay? And if you were to follow this ring all the way, um, it would put an epicenter of it somewhere down near Evansville. So, uh, Little Rock to Evansville, for sure, uh, 24 to 48 hours from now, okay? After this blows through, 24 to 48, you're looking at severe weather up to and including tornadoes. And that's so far just based upon this ring return. Now it looks like we may have another one forming to the east. Uh, let's look. 
Yes. There's a, you'll see it appear here in a second. Okay, see these edges of this ring here, and then the ring disappears. So that is coming out of, um, it's coming out of dice, or, well, tall B, T-A-U-L-B-E-E. -E. Okay, and that's Kentucky. Ah, yes, okay, coming up out of Epicenter near Grand Forks, south of Grand Forks in Mayville. Mayville to Ada, ADA. And that would be Ada, Wisconsin? Or no, Ada, Michigan? I don't even know what we're looking at here. Minnesota, okay. Ada, Minnesota, over to, um, let's get the actual town name. Yeah, Mayville, North Dakota. All right, and is there anything else? Yes, out of Billings. There's the edge of a giant ring return here, and this, of course, would indicate, again, 24 to 48 hours from now, then, Billings as well, Billings, Montana. And out of now one forming around western Missouri with an epicenter south of Belton. Just a little bit south of Belton now, not directly at Belton like it was before. <clears throat> okay, now let's go look at it on another radar. Here's AccuWeather Professional, and this is going to show us a high def image of uh, radar returns, and you can see it out of um, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Springfield, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, Wisconsin, up near Green Bay, any others? Ah, yes, Des Moines, Iowa. And even as far south as what looks to be Shreveport down here. Um, let's look at it on another radar image. This is the uh, actual Nextrad radar site from an EDU. And this is base reflectivity, so we're seeing the moisture in the air. And here is southern Missouri. This is where you're looking at here, southern Missouri. Arkansas is where the green is right now, and the storms are passing through Little Rock. Um, I just wanted to see what was happening on here, and of course you can see it. There's several things going on. The, these rotating signatures are the ground-based radar stations, and it shows you the frequency that they operate on. And so you can just see, you can imagine that the weather modulation systems are operating on a different set of frequencies, but they're doing the same thing. Um, but on a higher or lower frequency. And as they tune up or tune down, it goes through the radar band and it gets picked up. And the station is most likely right next to the ground-based Doppler station. So they're getting roughly the same diameter, same radius, same power source maybe. So there you have it. Let's go back to IntelliCast and take one more look at it so you can see it for, for a really good shot. Let's just see if we can get both of these in here. I'm going to get a good screenshot of this. Okay, one more time. All right. Um, hang in there, folks. Keep an eye on the radar, but just remember the name of, names of these towns. Um, Little Rock, Arkansas. Natchitoches, down to Alexandria over to Fort Polk, Louisiana, as far south as San Antonio, northeast through St. Louis, Springfield, Missouri, and let's jump over to the 
Ah, yes, here's a shot of all the low pressure systems. But let's jump over to the AccuWeather one more time. And Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Green Bay, Wisconsin, up in northeastern Wisconsin, Omaha, Nebraska, Des Moines, Iowa. This whole section right here, 24 to 48 hours from now, guys, severe weather. And that's indicated by the large number of signatures. And keep an eye on those specific towns that I named, and you'll see that several of them are going to get hit directly with the hardest part of the coming storm that's not yet even formed yet. This, this is going to be, get drawn up, and whatever gets pulled down this way, whatever it decides to form, is going to hit those towns. Most of them, most likely. Today, it was all of them. All of them got hit. Everyone that was named over the past two days got hit with the hardest part of whatever storm was coming. All right, hang in there, folks. Hey, YouTube. Dutch Sense here. It is 5.13 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sunday, May 22nd, 2011. And uh, 24 hours and 48 hours ago, Several of us put out harp ring videos, uh, letting everybody know where we were seeing the rings and to expect storms, uh, severe weather in the ring affected areas. And it was to be with this giant low pressure system that keeps pulling up these different bands of moisture, um, kind of in a haphazard, random way. And so I just want to point out to everybody, I'm going to put the videos down below. There's too many to name and it'll take forever for me to do this. So if you really want to know which ones were named and which ones were hit, um, I think we're over at 85%, 90% hit rate on this now, on this storm particularly. We named at least, I don't know, 10 or 15 specific cities that were going to be getting the hardest portions of this storm. And just for instance, like Green Bay, Wisconsin was named. All right? Look at what's going right over downtown Green Bay. The hardest part of this northern band Literally, there's just one here, one here, and one here, these three points. And the hardest points are going right over Green Bay. Uh, further to the south, St. Louis was named, right over the St. Louis airport and uh, right basically north of, of downtown St. Louis. We named Springfield, Missouri, uh, down into Little Rock. And here's Springfield is right here. And, of course, Little Rock is right here, so we're within just a few miles on each of those. And then Dallas was named, and San Antonio is named. Now, it looks like these are going to get drawn over to San Antonio. We'll see on San Antonio. Dallas, it's in the crosshairs for this evening. Um, also, in eastern Kentucky, uh, let's see, I think it was Mayville. Where is Mayville. Maysville, and I said Maysville down to Beattyville. Here's Beattyville, or Beattyville. Okay, and again, so that area is getting a large portion, and then I said up to uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was had a ring yesterday, and this is going to be going right into Pittsburgh. So. There you have it, folks. Watch the videos if you'd like to see the full forecast and what was predicted and what actually has come to fruition uh, as of 5.15 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sunday. All right, hang in there, folks, and keep watching the radar. Let me know if you see any other rings, and we'll get it out there for everybody so they can prepare. Hey, YouTube. Dutch Sense here. It is 1.07 a.m. Central Standard Time on Monday, May 23rd, 2011. And Joplin, Missouri got hit today with a major tornado and it killed 24 or more people. And um, here I'm going to go to the original video here and show you guys what's up. Um, on the 22nd, okay, or on, well, actually on the 21st, uh, the night of the 21st, right into the 22nd, right at midnight, I recorded a video where I'm circling in on the area of uh, from Little Rock all the way up to Springfield, Missouri. Okay, and you can see the ring returns in a second here. Okay, I mean, there's one here, there's one down here uh, coming out of Kansas City. There we go. So there's one here and there's one here, and Joplin, Missouri lies right in the middle. And then, of course, one appears over St. Louis. And let me full screen this. Okay. So 
Joplin, Missouri is right here at the edge in between these three rings. Now, I did not name Joplin specifically in the video. I did not name that. Um, down in the description box below, I have since updated it to show that Joplin got hit and that we were successful in predicting that the harp rings generate tornadoes right in the center. And it turns out these three make a big, gigantic triangle and the tornado came right through the center. Literally passed, well, right down this way, down through all three rings. So that's what my intent of showing success was. So, you know, when you go down below this video, I've updated it and I showed it. I, you know, I, I don't know what else to say other than we were successful in predicting on Joplin. So that should address the naysayers who are trying to say I came in and added it later. I didn't add it later. I think you're misunderstanding what I, what I was saying, that I already, you know, already had went in and updated my success and was showing you guys. So that should settle it, but uh, there you go. The center of the harp rings got hit. Uh, you know, right on. So if you if you were to draw a line through the center of where this this storm track actually went, um, it went down right through it, literally right through the center. And then further on over, uh, it's gone down to the southeast, and now it's going through the other rings that appeared um, further down down the line. So there you go, guys. Uh, just keep paying attention to the radar, and it was a you know a successful forecast for all those involved, those of you who told me, etc. And thank you so much. And just keep watching out, and don't listen to the trolls and naysayers because they're really trying hard to find reasons now not to believe. And so they're going to do everything they can to try and trick trip you up and trick you up. And uh, so that's something to keep an eye out for from these people. And it seems like there's a certain group that's pushing that. You know, I'm, my, I'm just willing to go wherever it leads me when it comes to figuring out what's happening here. I'm not precluding anything. I'm not saying anything can or cannot exist because unless you're a harp expert, <laughs> unless you're actually working at one of these stations, etc., and even then. So no one person can be a, a, a complete expert on this subject other than to do these forecasts, watch and keep track of which places rings form out of and which places get hit with the storms. And this is not regular background clutter, radiation, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just really, honestly, um, we're witnessing a new type of weather manipulation. And it's being picked up on radar. Here, Dutch Sense specifically makes mention of having problems with trolls lately and people really trying to find reasons not to believe. Dutch even mentions that there seems to be a specific group of people leaving comments on his videos and trash-talking his work. This would go to suggest that Dutch Sense, an energy weapons researcher, is having his information suppressed. Dutch Sense here. It is 10.37 p.m. Central Standard Time on Thursday, May 26, 2011. And we're looking at IntelliCast view of Colorado into uh, Goodland, Kansas. And northeast of Pueblo, southeast of Colorado Springs, right down here at the cross intersection of these counties here, we're seeing a radar ring return. And it's obvious on the radar. I mean, you can't miss it. Um, but what it starts out as is a scalar square. Scalar square first, right here just the defining edges, the flat edges, and then it goes into a ring further south. Scalar square up here, ring further south, southwest. Now out of Goodland, Kansas, you can see a similar style ring return. So what this means is we can issue a forecast for severe weather from Pueblo, Colorado to Goodland, Kansas in the next 24 to 48 hours after this current thing blows through here, um, you can basically expect severe weather to come to this area based upon these signatures. This is a charging of the air, I think. It's the, a charging of the atmosphere for the next storm to come through. So there you have it, folks. Just keep an eye on Pueblo and Goodland, Kansas over the next 24 to 48. Hang in there. 
Hey YouTube, Dutch Sense here. It is 9.03 p.m. Central Standard Time on Saturday, May 28th, 2011. And a day, uh, roughly a day ago, there was a series of ring and scalar squares that appeared out of uh, basically just east of Pueblo, southeast of Colorado Springs, right here, okay, where my mouse is, and up here in Goodland, Kansas. Now, this is live on IntelliCast Radar. I want to show you what's happening. Literally, just literally right north of where the ring appeared. The ring appeared here with an epicenter right where this uh, meeting of the county lines is at this plus section here. And directly north is where the severe cell has just picked up and is going northeast, um, roughly in the direction of Goodland. So it's a confirmation again, guys, this is, and just to show you, there's no, this is the most severe portion of the, there you go. The ring appeared right here where my hand is a day and a half ago. And that's what's happening right now. So there you have it, folks. It's another confirmation. I don't know if this will go tornadic, but it looks like it definitely has hail associated with the interior of the storm. Uh, anytime you see it go pinkish to white, um, you definitely know that there's a, uh, a large return of, of hail inside the storm. So hang in there. Keep an eye on this area, Pueblo, Colorado, up to Goodland, Kansas, and that's part of the forecast. I'll link the uh, original forecast that I did almost two days ago um, down below. Hang in there, folks. Nobody can say, okay, if, if they use this device and transmit, you know, this type of radio wave or microwave or, or electromagnetic wave with this much power over this much distance, it will cause this much destruction to this type of material. You understand? These are specifics that not only have they not been checked, we don't get them. We don't get them. The specifics do not exist. And this is what they did actually in a study sponsored by the Air Force. The study was at the University of Utah. It was completed in 1985, and it was um, under the auspices of the Science Advisory Board to the Air Force, and it was it produced what's called the Radio Frequency Dosimetry Handbook. Simple language. It's the dosages of radio frequency energy necessary to override every vital organ of the body, including the brain, whether it be the liver, the kidneys, the heart, the lungs, to interfere with their natural performance as, weapon, as a weapon or weapon application. Now, again, you're talking about energy that is different. We're talking about a whole different view of warfare. We're using energy as the base. These technologies are now being developed for things like the active denial system, which is using um, knowledge of microwave millimeter waves to affect the body to create uh, pain or heat sensations, affecting only the nerve endings on the surface of the body. But these basic principles apply to the entire living organism. So Jose Delgado is an interesting guy. He was at Yale University in the mid-60s. He began mapping the human brain by planting electrodes in primates and humans to see how to affect the different parts of the brain, figure out what parts of the brain were affected um, and, and affected our, you know, our health and the way we thought and just sort of how the brain worked, mapping it out. Well, by the mid-80s, you know, he had figured out a lot of other things. He found out that not only could you map the brain, but you could stimulate the brain. And so starting in, in 1969, he put the implants in, and there's a famous image of him with the charging bull, and he throws the switch of a radio a transmitter, and the bull stops right in its tracks, right in front of the guy. And in this case, he used an, an implant that affected um, the bull in a way that caused it to, to stop. Now, what he found by the mid-80s is he didn't need any implanted technology whatsoever. All he needed was radio frequency energy modulated and pulsed in just the right way uh, to carry a signal. And what they found is it took only one fiftieth of what the Earth's natural radio frequency energy level was to affect us dramatically. And with the case of primates and humans, making them lethargic or passive, uh, almost asleep, to highly agitated and awake, back and forth, back and forth, like throwing a light switch on and off, on and off. No implants, no physical contact, using radio frequency energy, one-fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces. HARP 
in its earth penetrating tomography mode will produce 50 times more energy than is necessary to override normal brain function according to the research at Yale University and the research conducted by the Air Force and Navy in all of those projects that we cite uh, within our published work. Okay, I used to be an electronics technician. I know about things like, you know, electricity, you know, wattage, resistant average, all this kind of crap, you know. Things don't flow through the air so easily because there's nothing for them to conduct through, okay? Is, all right. I'm not going to go into all the details right now. Frankly, I don't know all of the details because nobody talks about any of the details. Okay, I used to be an electronics technician. I know about things like, you know, electricity, you know, wattage, resistant average, all this kind of crap, you know. I'm not going to go into all the details right now. Frankly, I don't know all of the details because nobody talks about any of the details. Now, why exactly would Harry Link be doing these things? Why would he be making such statements that are so easily proven wrong and contradictory? Now, you could look to motive. Why would somebody want to do this? When uh, an intelligence organization is buffeted by disinformation, it paralyzes the organization. What I'm saying is that we need to look into this a lot more. We need to actually have a movement-wide great debate about beam weapons or energy weapons because there is so much information in the movement being passed around and it's, it, it's sketchy. All right, now we see exactly what this is about energy weapons and beam weapons. It's very peculiar that Harry Link chooses this point in time to come out against energy weapons and beam weapons being as how just weeks before this I released my video where I confronted Richard Gage about Dr. Judy Wood's research into directed energy weaponry being used on 9-11. Could, ther could thermite do that? I don't know. Gage, you just talked about thermite for two hours. How can you possibly not know if thermite could do that or not? Could thermite do that? I don't know. Um, if, if, if it were placed in all, all the beams uh, in, in that particular area, mm -hmm. um, I imagine it could. Um, but why not? But why not the whole like? I mean, building seven clearly gone. The tower is clearly gone. These buildings. Standing with weird cookie cutter holes in them. Yeah, yeah, no, it's weird. I, I, I agree with you. Um, that's just more of the same kind of stuff. There's like uh, climbing into the building. Um, and then the cars. The cars are. Richard Gage. Something else that Curry. I... Kareem? Kareem. Kareem? Kareem? Kevin Sutton. Yeah. You're Kevin Sutton? Yeah. Oh. Fatna. 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 Yeah. You're her son. Now, what goes on here is outstandingly suspicious and weird. Kareem Barrett, Professor Kevin Barrett's son, comes over and interrupts my interview with Richard Gage. Kevin Barrett is another outspoken member of 9-11 Truth who's a former professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who allegedly lost his tenure for standing up for the issue of 9-11 Truth. The problem I have with Mr. Barrett is that he does not seem to want to go into certain issues. As well, I know that Kevin Barrett, as I have met him in the past, has raised his son to be more respectful and courteous than to interrupt an on-camera interview. My only conclusion on this matter can be that Mr. Barrett, who was within earshot of my conversation with Mr. Richard Gage, purposely sent his son over to interrupt and run interference on my interview. You know, I don't have an explanation for, for that car. Okay. You know, I don't know what happened to it, assuming it was here. You can see that it sustained incredible heat. Um, now, some of these cars, these toasted... 
uh, they're, they're, where they're not so worked, mm -hmm. that would be explained, I would think, by falling molten iron droplets, which is what you have. Right. That could, that could be but these, this is blocks Hurry. away. Well, like most of the photos of the cars, these cars are blocks away from ground zero. Yeah. These are like, that's all warped and ridiculous. Like, yeah, what? Yeah, thermite's not going to be doing that. Right, right. And I mean, that, and that's, you know, like, that's what I figured. That's weird. So I'm like, you know, I just, I didn't know if you guys have seen this stuff. No. But like, in this, okay, like, speculate. The paper, uh, paper, like, no, this is all, this up. is just burning and like destructive, but like the paper is just kicking it. Yeah. This is burning and like destructive, but like the paper is just kicking it. Yeah. Like, no, it's yeah. More destroyed cars. Um, yeah. Like that one, like half of it's, half of it's toasted and the other half is perfectly fine. And like on, and on one of them, on one of them, the, the, it was like you know a distance from wheel to wheel. One one wheel was destroyed to the point where it was like basically gone, and the back wheel was still there, and the tire was inflated, like full inflated tire. The other tire is like gone, and there's nothing but you know. So it's like just like this one and this. One. Yeah, I mean I can't quite see the tires on that picture, but yeah, it's like yeah. No, it's weird. So There's a lot of strange phenomena going on. A, a lot of it. <laughs> now, so I guess I was just. But how are you going to sound if you go out on the street and show people these pictures and say what's going on? I mean, how you, you can't get people motivated to, to take action by showing them questions for which you have no answers. Questions for which there are no answers. Richard, go to drjudywood.com. There are plenty of scientific answers there. Plenty. I'm showing questions for which we have lots of very clear, solid, evidentiary, scientific, forensic-based answers. And they can move with it and, and, and put people away for a long time for treason for it. Richard, as you must know, thermite alone absolutely does not go to explain everything that happened on 9-11 that day and the destructions of, of those buildings. As well, when we try these culprits, when we try the perpetrators that pulled off 9-11, we only have one shot, so we better get it right. We better make sure that we know how they did it. Because if we go to court with just thermite, and they can prove that thermite doesn't explain everything, then we don't have a case. And they can move with Way for a long time for treason for it, so uh, that's oh, and that's why it. I show that stuff instead of this stuff. Okay, so you've seen these before, you haven't seen yeah. these before, though. I've seen them. Okay, okay. Yeah. But that's not what you said earlier, Richard. I didn't know if you guys have seen this stuff. No, you've seen these before, you haven't seen yeah. these before, though. I've seen them. Okay, okay. I was told uh, that these. Photos are the work of a person named Dr. Judy Wood. Oh, so she she's uh, basically attacking our work for some reason, which seems very uh, solid to me and to right. thousands of other people. She says that the steel beams were turned to dust, um, and I don't see the evidence for that. Good Lord. There are no words. You can see large pieces of the building falling. You can see the smoke rising. You can see a portion of the, the, the side of the building now just being covered on the right side, as I look at it, covered in smoke. And there is also another reason I find it very peculiar that Harry Link is coming out against energy weapons and weapons such as HARP at this point in time. Because right now, what's been going on? You keep track of the news cycle, and they're pushing the alien agenda, the extraterrestrial UFO agenda, very, very heavily, and they have been for quite some time. Now, it's well known in the research community that they may very well be getting ready to orchestrate a false flag alien invasion or contact...
Now, I have since come to believe that the extraterrestrial portion of all of this is nonsense, but that the technology is real, is real. I believe that many of us were shown these documents over the years so that later we would talk about it. I mean, how can you keep the existence of extraterrestrials, if they were real, a secret? And how could anyone keep quiet knowing that they had seen documentation, official government documents, labeled top secret, that expressed that these extraterrestrials were real and had visited this earth? I wanted to know just how true all of this was, and I began a program of research to find out if extraterrestrials were real. What I discovered was amazing. What I discovered, ladies and gentlemen, is that there has been a plan in existence since about 1917, and probably before that, to create an artificial extraterrestrial threat to this Earth in order to create a one-world totalitarian socialist government. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-our-world invasion threat. And it continues on another page. Nevertheless, an effective political substitute for war would require alternate enemies, some of which might seem equally far-fetched in the context of the current war system. I know for a fact that the plan is to make all of us feel totally helpless. That what's happening is beyond our realm to affect because we've been taken over by aliens. That our independence day is dawning. So beware of that. Understand that those criminals have been keeping information and technology from us under their blanket of national security. They are 25 years ahead of us, at least, technologically. Can you imagine what they've got now? The logo of the X-Files is the truth is out there. The truth is out there. I'm going to paraphrase. The truth is in here. We are here today to disclose the truth about a subject that has been ridiculed and questioned, denied for at least 50 years. The men and women who are on this stage and the some 350 additional military intelligence witnesses to the so-called UFO matter and extraterrestrial intelligence can prove and will prove that we are not alone. Now, it's well known in the research community that they may very well be getting ready to orchestrate a false flag alien invasion or contact, and in doing so, I personally believe that these weapons that they were using on 9-11, such as the directed energy weapons, and these weapons such as HARP, I do believe that these weapons will be directly and intimately involved in the false flag alien invasion and or contact. Why do I say this, you might ask? Again, as we advance this revolution of military affairs, which is this com, uh, concept of, of warfare emerging here uh, in the beginning of the 21st century and at the end of the last century. Now, that concept essentially came from a paper written in 1989 by the U.S. Army War College and it was uh, a paper that was called The Revolution of Military Affairs. And what it said is that the technology was changing so dramatically, they equated it with the change that happened when gunpowder was introduced to Europe in the Middle Ages or when atomic uh, weapons were introduced in the middle of the last century. That's the kind of revolution taking place today using energy as the base of the science. Not bullets and bombs, but speed of light technologies from high-powered lasers to particle beams to harp systems. These are the systems of the 21st century, and here's what we have to consider. When you're using energy discharges, like for instance in, in an anti-ballistic um, missile arrangement where you've got incoming uh, missiles, you know, here in Alaska, we've become the place where they built the new 
uh, missile defense system. So they've installed un in underground silos interceptors, you know, literally bullets to hit other bullets flying at us at about 30,000 miles an hour in reentry speeds. They're going to try and pick those off, and in most of the tests so far conducted, they failed. The reality is they won't use conventional warheads to knock out these craft. They're going to use space-based laser systems that are being developed, other energy-based systems. And the reason we know this is because you have the ability to, number one, target with precision. These weapons, when they fire a laser or a particle beam, they travel at the speed of light, 186,300 miles per second. That can literally go around the planet seven times with time left over in less than a second. So being able to target, say, an intercontinental ballistic missile, you'd literally be able to knock it out of the sky before it ever left the launch pad uh, with this type of technology. That's where missile defense is going in the 21st century. The interceptors are the party line for the public. The reality is these other systems are advancing. The Department of Energy has owned patents since the late 1980s that are cited in the book Earth Rising, the Revolution, which I wrote with James Roderick a number of years ago. The fact is they've had the technology. They're advancing the technology. HARP is a part of this advancement, this revolution of military affairs. One of the other applications of the, of the HARP technology is the idea of energy transfer from one place on the planet to another. And this is really one of the more interesting ones. It's, it's one of the first tests, in fact, the first test of a small array was to see if you could focus the radio frequency energy in a way where you could take uh, electrical energy, convert it to radio frequency energy, then send it back up into, say, a satellite or a low-orbiting space platform, and turn that radio frequency energy back into electrical energy where it can be utilized as a power source. Now why this is important, as a power source, if you think about it, low orbiting space platforms, if you could put these low orbiting uh, space platforms around the planet to utilize energy-based technologies like space-based lasers, you could get closer to your targets, but you have to have a fuel source. You can't just keep sending shuttles up there with um, energy. You have to be able to get the energy uh, to those lower orbiting space platforms. And what they, could f they figured they could do with HARP and systems like HARP is keep energized space platforms for up to 10,000 hour missions. So literally, indefinitely, keeping objects afloat by continually feeding them the necessary energy they need to recharge uh, and maintain their power levels. Well, there you have it, folks floating space platforms, infinitely charged with energy and armed with lasers. What exactly do these holes look like they were cut with to you? Lasers from space. Now, I am not going to say point blank that Harry Link is disinformation. I am not saying Harry Link does not exist. I don't know for sure if Harry Link is disinfo, although I suspect that he is. What I am saying for sure is that directed energy weapons do exist, and the powers that be clearly do not want us being aware of them and their capabilities. I am saying that the bloodlines that run the planet are planning a false flag extraterrestrial event, and that has been very well documented. I am saying do your research and don't believe anything until you investigate it thoroughly for yourself. And most importantly, I am saying don't believe the deception when they tell you that the aliens are here. In another video I'll have coming in the future, I'll get into what exactly aliens are and decipher the truth from the lies of the abduction phenomena. Until next time, God bless all who have the heart to share this information. If it weren't for those of you with the determination to do so, all my efforts would be useless.